Income tax 2021-2022 software example, child and dependent care expenses for married filing joint filers. Get ready to get refunds to the max. Dive it into income tax 2021-2022. Lacert Tax Software, you don't need tax software to follow along, but you might want to have access to the forms and schedules, which can be found at the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Our starting point will be, we've got the married filing jointly with the Adam and Eve Smith living in Beverly Hills 90210, along with their son, their dependent, Sam Smith, child uh, qualifies for the child tax credit we got the seventy thousand at the wages noting it's important to be able to allocate between the two spouses for the credit that we're focused on this time we got the standard deduction for married filing joint twenty five thousand one hundred getting us the forty four nine for the taxable income if i was to mirror that on our income tax formula we're going to say income what did i say seventy thousand i think it was for the w-2 income not seven thousand 70,000. One zero makes a big difference. 44.9, 44.9. Page two, calculating the tax at the 4993. 4993, 4993. There's our starting point. And so we're, we're focusing this time not on the child tax credit, but for the expenditures for the uh, child and dependent care expenses. So keep those two things separate in your mind. We're gonna be looking over here on the 2441 child and dependent care expenses, Adam and Eve. You'll note that the first part basically is who we paid. And just remember the basic premise of this uh, particular credit being that you're paying someone for the child care in order to free you up so that you could go work. So that means that uh, if you're married, then the IRS's perspective then is in general, then both spouses should have some form of earned income as evidence, unless there's some kind of exception as evidence that they worked, because that's the reason that you're paying for the, the care provider. In other words, if one of the spouses has no earned income, the presumption in general being that they didn't work and therefore you wouldn't need uh, the credit. So keep that in mind because it kind of helps you to, to visualize what's going on here with the with the credit. So up top, we got the people that we're paying. The institutions might be an institution, might be then uh, an individual. We got the, the care provider's name. We've got the address and such. And then we've got the identification number, which might be the social security number if an individual or the EIN number if it's an organization. You might request and get this information from a W-10, which you could find in the IRS website. That's the Dependent Care Providers Identification and Certification, where you got the address and the number and so on for that information. If they, if they worked for you, so check here if the care provider is your household employee, we would check that out and then the amount that we pay them. And then down below, we've got the people for whom the care was provided. That will typically be a dependent. In this case, our one dependent, that being Sam Smith, that being our starting point. So if I do the data input on this, I could say, okay, I've, I've got two sides to it. I've got the person that, uh, that the care is being provided for, that being a dependent, which pulls over from the dependent information. Typically, I'm going to pay them a large amount, which is over the threshold so we can see where the cap is at. And then the second component being who you paid, either an individual or institution, and the two amounts should match, meaning that, you know, the sum of, of who we paid for should match the number of institutions that we paid, in this case, one and one, one person we paid for, one institution. And then if I go back to the forms, that's where the 20000 is. Notice it's being capped here on line three at 8000 because I only have one person up top. In other words, if, if we then say that we're going to read this out, add the amounts in column C of line two. Don't enter more than 8,000 if you had one qualifying person or 16,000 if you had two or more persons. If you completed part three, enter the amount from line 31. We'll talk about that later. The earned income is being, pull, is being pulled from the first page, but notice it's breaking it out between 50 and eight and 50 and 20 here. That's important because we've got the earned income and then we've got line five, which says, if married filing jointly, enter your spouse's earned income. So notice on line one, we had the, the 70,000 on page one, line one. And if I go into the data input forms, that is being made up of two uh, W-2s here, one for one spouse, one for the other. If I was to uncheck this, 
then it would it would only be like one spouse if i i could do that by accident so just note that's important with software because you got to be able to allocate it to each spouse for this credit then i no longer get the credit by default because i don't have earned income for one of the spouses so by default if there's no earned income then you would think that that spouse would be able to take care of the child and you wouldn't have the reason for the credit so i got to have earned income for the two spouses here 50 70 broke out broken out which makes it a little bit more complex than if i was doing the credit calculation for a non-married individual so there we have it so now we're at the 50 and the 20 and so so then we've got the income threshold here and we've got our thresholds down below for the phase out kind of uh, thresholds and then we've got the calculation at 50 percent for the 4,000. that 4,000 is flowing through to page number three not on uh I'm sorry, schedule three, page number two. And there it is down here in the refundable area. You can also see it's refundable. Notice the schedule is other payments and refundable credits. You could also see that it's a refundable by going to the 1040 page two. It flows in down here and kind of like the refundable area down below uh, on line 31, as opposed to up top, which would be like the non refundable area. Refundable meaning it acts kind of like a payment in that even if your tax liability goes below zero you'd still get a tax benefit from it general idea okay let's go back on over to the 2441 the 2441 notice that we have our income limitations here so if the income was going below say uh the eight thousand let's say we had like a very small amount of income but still income for both spouses let's say it was two thousand and one thousand for example and then go on over to my forms. So now, uh, even though I, I had the 20,000 that I put in place, you can see the calculation is gonna be a lot smaller because of the income being below that threshold. Let's bring the income back to where it was before, which was the 50,000 and the 20,000. So now we're back to where we were before. And then we've got our thresholds here. If line, if line seven is 125,000 or less, enter 50.5 on line eight. If line seven is over 25,000 and no more than 438, you see the instructions. So that's where the phase out starts to happen. So if my income was over that, so let's make this like 150,000, for example. Now I go back on over, I'm at 170 which is over the threshold and you can see it reflected in the percentage here that is now lowering the amount of the credit that's going to be the phase out taking place if it goes way up above the 438 then it's gone entirely so if i made 500,000 like 500,000 then gone it's gone that's why it just disappeared so let's bring it back down to the original let's bring it back down to 50 and 20 50 20 that's where we started at and let's say now that we had another another dependent. So if I go back on over and say we've got another dependent, we've got Jane, we've got Jane. Welcome, Jane. We're looking forward to the tax benefits that you provide us <laughs> to the family. Uh, so anyway, we're gonna go back on over to the forms and say now on page one of the form 1040, we've got Sam and Jane. But notice I didn't change anything on the 2441 because I still allocated all the payment that I made to this institution to Sam. And so even though Jane's on, on there, it's, it's not affecting kind of the cap of the credit. So even if I didn't pay any institution for Jane, if she qualifies, then I can add Jane here and say, let's put Jane on like my 2441 form and say, add another one and put then Jane in place even though I didn't pay anything to the institution for Jane, it was all paid for Adam. So still 20,000 to the institution, but all for Adam, but Jane is qualifying then. Go back to the forms. Now we've got the same 20,000 going to the institution. We've got it all going to Sam, not Adam, Sam. Sam Adam's the dad. We didn't pay for Adam's daycare. And then Jane was zero. So now it's up to 16,000 here and the credit now has been increased 8,000 flowing into page three of, so there's the 8,000 flows into page two, that was schedule three, page two of the 1040, there is that. So there is that. Now, if you added, if you added another one, it's not gonna increase it anymore. So if I said, let's add another one, let's have another dependent. This is great. 
We need another dependent for our taxes. So, so I'm going to add another dependent. That's not the reason you should have a... We need a dependent tax benefit person. So we're going to go on over here and say we got another one. And so now we've got three here. Let's add that third one to our to our 2441 and say we've got another one. We don't even name them anymore. We just call them a letter T. We go right through the alphabet. Right through the alphabet. T Smith, that's what the name is. So then we're going to go down to the 2441. So now we've got the same 20,000. We've got three of them now, but we still capped it out at that 16. So T Smith didn't even give us the benefit that like Sam and Jane did. What's with that, T? Anyway, we like T in any case. So you could, of course, allocate then differently between uh, these two. You might say that you had Sam was 10,000 that you paid for Sam and possibly Jane 10,000 or maybe 5,000 for Jane and then T you spent you spent 5,000 for T so this should add up meaning if I go to the form now we still paid 20,000 to the institution one institution three people 10 for Sam five for Jane and five for T and we're still at the the 8,000 on that allocation as well now you could also have an, an allocation difference here like let's say one of one of the spouse made made only like like uh like 100 1500 dollars let's say that's 15 1500 so now you've got you've got 50,000 and 1500 so if i go back on over that adds up to the uh, 51,500 but notice down here we've got we've got a uh a, 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 a smaller amount of the calculation because it's basically multiplying times the 1,500, you know, the smaller amount because it's thought that that's kind of the amount that was freed up, I guess, would be the logic or rationale uh, bef before that. Now, you could have a situation where they're a student as well. So you might say, well, like a spouse is a student, for example. So if I was to say, maybe if, if I was to say, and I'll just do this fairly quickly, but you might have an exception and say they were they were a disabled or a student, for example. And let's say that was the spouse. And let's put it in for 12 for all 12 months, 12 months student. So I'm going to go back on over now. Now you've got the threshold 50,000 for one spouse and the other spouse is now at the 7,500. So it kind of did a calculation. I won't go into that in detail. You want to, you know, check out the instructions for that. But that could, of course, have a positive impact on uh, the calculation as well. It could go the other way, too. You could say that whichever spouse had was a student or whatever. Maybe this one was at 1500 and this one was at 50,000. And then if I go back on over, so so now the one that was so so now the one that was the student was going to be going to be the other it's going to be like the other way around so then if i say okay let's go back to my student my student data input thing jumping to here and i'm going to go back down and say and say was a student and this time this one was the student so they kind of took turns i guess or something so then so then you got that calculation so you got so you could see how that can kind of work. If one of the spouses didn't work, but they were a student or disabled, then you got to look into those instructions and that might give you uh, a benefit for the calculation of the amount of the expenses that could be deductible. Let's go back to the original one. Let's take that away. Let's go back to the original scenario where we had the 50,000 and the 20,000. Let's get back to the normal C here, back to the norm. Now you might have a situation where one or other had schedule C type of income. So let's say let's say one of the spouses had a schedule C income, so that would qualify too. So we had no W2, but we had schedule C income and then you'd have to make sure that it's applied to the proper person, in this case the spouse we're going to say and that's going to be the gross income. We'll say that that she made there's the 20,000 and so I'm going to pull that back on over so so now we've got we've got the amount being calculated here 
for the expenses for the 50 and then the 18 587 from the schedule c so or you might have a situation where you have one schedule c so you're going to say okay what if for example i had no w-2 wages but the schedule c was a joint a joint venture joint venture going back on over you got to be careful with the common property laws and, and community property and whatnot to do the allocation here but then we've got the allocation between between the two and you can kind of see that on the schedule se because you're going to have two schedule se's that we talked about before when we looked at the schedule c stuff because it's a joint schedule c okay let's go back to the original we got no schedule c stop that schedule c go back to the wages we're back at the normal wages with the fifty thousand and the twenty thousand 50 and 20 back to the forms on the 2441 we're at uh, the 50 and the 20 again now you could have benefits on a double on the w2 so one of the w2s or both possibly you got you've got benefits on line 10 so that would be shown on the w2 so if that were the case that could have an impact and that would be shown on the second page of the form so i could go back to one of these w2s and let's say on line 10 here we had 2000 of dependent care benefits that would mean that you already got the benefit because it wasn't included in line one wouldn't be included for federal income taxes so then that would have an impact you can't like double dip on the credit is the idea of it so if i go back on over then now we have page two which is in essence dipping into this calculation so line 12 enter the total amount of dependent care benefits you received in 2021 it's a w2 line 10 and in essence you can see the 16,000 we had before is decreased by the 2000 now at the 14,000 in essence if i go to i'm sorry if i go to page one then you've got the starting point instead of the 16,000 now basically at the 14,000 is the general idea there Okay, let's go back to the original again. Let's get rid of that. Let's go back to the original. And let's just, lastly, you could have combat pay. This is something that's a little bit more unusual, but you might have combat pay. So combat pay, if I go back on over, and let's say, let's say I had another person here or another W-2. Let's say this is, a, this is combat pay, and this is for the spouse, let's say. And let's say there's no wages here, but we had combat pay, which will be shown in box 12 with a Q, I think, a Q, which is non-taxable combat pay. And let's say that that was 10,000. So notice if I, if I didn't have the combat pay, if I just put like a one here, so they made $1 and then they made combat pay so and i didn't allocate the combat pay what would happen if i go to my forms then the 2441 is severely limited uh due, due to the due to the combat pay or actually the combat pay has been included we elected for it to be included so now we're at the 10,001. and if we made that combat pay even higher here we're going to say there's there's going to be let's say it was 20,000 of combat pay for the spouse so now you've got the 20,000 and you've kind of maxed out the credit, even though the amount on the on the 1040 is the 50,000 because the combat pay is basically not included. So in other words, if I went to the 1040, we've only got the 50,000. It's not including the combat pay, but you can elect possibly to have the combat pay be included with the for the calculation of the 2441. You also want to be careful of that with the earned income tax credit so you can kind of do what you want wild card with the combat pay meaning you don't include it in box one so you might not have to pay federal income taxes but you might be able to include it for other things such as calculations of credits such as possibly this credit the child and dependent care credit and possibly uh the earned income tax credit okay let's get rid of the combat pay go back to the normal stuff no combat pay 50 20 again 50 20 so we've got the normal breakout and then let's just note that here on box b for 2021 your credit for child and dependent care expenses is refundable if uh you or your spouse if married filing jointly had a principal place of abode in the united states so if that were not the case then i could uncheck this and then just check out what that does 
So we've unchecked that box now. So if I scroll down, we've got a, a limitation on the calculation that then pulls into schedule three and notice it's up top on page one this time, non-refundable credits as opposed to page two where it was uh, before. And then if I go to the 1040, we're gonna see on page two that it's up top here in, in this area as opposed to uh, down below calculation down below here and it's being limited by the amount of income so if i change that back just so we can see the difference between the two and if i say let's change this back and i'm going to go okay now on page two it's not up here but rather it's down here and it's not being limited by the liability so it's beneficial to have it of course on the refundable area and then if i go to schedule c three it's not here it's on schedule two other payments and, and uh, page two of schedule three other payments so this is going to be the refundable credits and that then if i go to the 8812 is being represented by that box being checked off that's what that box does all right